Good morning. Welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand. Page 305. Praise him, praise him. Sing it out. Praise, praise him, praise him, him Jesus, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all earth this wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, I start angels in glory. Strength and honor give in his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever. comes up. Yeah. 
let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, we do love you, God. We thank you for all you do for us. God, we're thankful for, uh, again, just another opportunity to be in your house, an opportunity to look at your word and learn from your word and, and uh, fellowship together and edify and encourage one another. And uh, God, we're thankful for uh, just how you, uh, you provide for us and you, you give us more than we could ever possibly uh, need or want. And uh, God, we pray you just be with us today uh, in this service. God, we're thankful uh, for the opportunity again to, to just praise you and worship you. And God, we pray you'd be with the, uh, the preaching uh, later on and uh, continue to be with the singing. God, we pray for those that still are on their way here this morning. God, we pray for those that uh, can't be here this morning. God, those that are watching online. Uh, God, we pray you'd be with them and bless them as well. And uh, Lord, we do love you. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Page 506, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a people online here. I mean, look at this lounging around in your backyard, shorts on. You guys ought to be ashamed of yourself. Anyway, well, we're glad to have you. Ajay's online too. It's good to see you also. Uh, all right. Um, uh, what was I going to say here? That's visitors time. Okay, visitors. Praise the Lord. We have Jerry and Sue Faf. Did I say that right? It's P-F-A-F-F, -F, but it's pronounced Faf. Missionaries to uh, Papua New Guinea, and so uh, praise the Lord for you guys, and I understand Jim was telling me you guys worked on translating the Bible to your, your is it for the, all of Indonesia, or just, or one, how many languages are there? Over 850 in Yeah, I know in India it's like that too, there's all kinds of dialects and everything else, so anyway, praise the Lord, we're thankful for your work in the ministry, I know you're friends with several of our folks here at the church, and so we're glad that you were able to join us this morning. Praise the Lord, we're glad you're here. It's good to have G and Jess here. I did not know that they were going to be here today, but uh, they were at the wedding yesterday, and that brings us to the other thing I wanted to make mention. Uh, I didn't think it was possible, but Wade, the Bible says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and Wade found a wife that was able to stick with him, I mean, up until the I do's. I, you know, I had my fingers crossed behind my back, you know, to see if she was actually going to go through with it. But uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Wade and Mrs. Stephanie are married. Uh, that was down in Bowie, Maryland yesterday. It was quite an ordeal. It was a busy week. We had um, uh, the graduation at the college, and then 
um, uh, you know, all the stuff, the finals and everything else this week. It was a crazy week that week, that way. And then Mr. Wade's wedding, and it was because it was down in Bowie. Uh, it was an overnight thing, and a lot of you were there. And, um, and so, and, and, and it, was, it was a big process because we had, to, um, we had to bring a lot of our sound system down there because it was an outdoor wedding, and I guess just Wade felt more comfortable you know, with our equipment and, and everything else. He knew how our equipment works, so we brought our speakers down and, and everything. And then that all had to be packed up after the wedding, so 7 o'clock last night, Isan and Kyle and Larry and all these guys are, are packing everything back up, bringing it back here. And then this morning, before the 8.30 service, they're scrambling, trying to get all the sound system back in place. And, um, you know, I appreciate all the work that they all put into it. And uh, that's a blessing. Uh, you know, if, if, if it was 20 years ago and I had just gotten here, that would have been me doing everything. Me and Phil, I guess. But, uh, but anyway, praise the Lord for everybody that had a part in that. And so um, uh, we're, we're glad, we're thrilled to have, have been a part of Wade's wedding yesterday. Um, if you're visiting with us here, I don't think we have any first time, first time visitors. We have some returning visitors. We're glad you guys are here. And we have some people we haven't seen in a very long time. We had some, in the 830 service also, we had somebody that came back to church that has not been to church since pre-COVID. And, uh, she got her vaccinations, I guess. And, and she was two weeks past and she said, I'm, she called me, she said, I'm coming to church. And so she came back to church and we were glad to see her. And uh, there's some people here today that we haven't seen in a long time. We're glad you're back. And uh, we're, we're going to try to uh, keep you as safe as we can. Uh, it's no guarantees, though. There's the virus out there, and it is what it is. So, uh, but we'll, we'll do our best to try to keep it as safe as we can. Um, if you, but if you're visiting with us online and you would like information about the church, or if you just want to communicate any questions you have about the church, there's a button on our website called My Response. And if you hit that button, give us whatever information um, that you want to give us. You don't have to answer any question except for, I think, you have to give us your email address. That's the only one you have to give us. Outside of that, just give us whatever information you want, and we'll stay in touch with you. We'll let you know what's going on here at the church. If there's any changes in the schedule or if there's anything special going on, we'll keep you posted about that. All right? We're glad you're here. It's a beautiful day out there. I bet you're praying I get done early so you can get out there. Enjoy the day. Hope you come back tonight, by the way. Uh, Paul is uh, in the middle of his series of messages on Christology. We're going through basic Bible doctrines. And when I say basic Bible doctrines, there's really nothing basic about Christology. It's very deep, profound doctrine, and there's a lot of things involved in it. Uh, we went through Bibliology, spent several weeks there doing Christology, and we'll eventually get to the rest of them. But we're just enjoying uh, Paul's passion and his preparation, really, in preparing these messages. And I think he's enjoying them as well. It looks like he's enjoying himself up there preaching, preaching the Bible on Sunday evening. So come back 5 o'clock for that. All right, we're going to sing uh, Great is the Lord. This is a scripture song. You can follow along on the screens or you can follow along in your Bible. We're going to be in Psalm 48 and also in Psalm 23. Yep. Amen. Let's all stand. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation. standing for the scripture reading. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. I'll read verses 16, 17, and then we'll all read verse 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. 
The Bible says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother, his brother have need, and shut up, shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Verse 18, altogether. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen. May God give the blessing to the reading of his word. We're going to be in page 145. I love to tell the story. Vacation Bible School meeting May 5th, and we'll be here at the church. If you have any questions, you can see Ashley Acosta. Again, that's May 5th. If you're interested in helping out with VBS, um, that's coming up in a couple of months here. We're going to have our first meeting on May 5th. And um, Mother's Day brunch, May 15th, here at the church at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're interested in coming, 
please make sure you register online to let us know how many of you will be attending so that we um, can prepare for you. There is no charge for this event. There will be a brief word of encouragement and a great time of fellowship. If you have any questions here, um, you can see Mrs. Erickson. And that's May 15th at 10 o'clock in the morning here at the church. Old Fashioned Tent Meeting, May 23rd through the 26th at Cardiff Baptist Church over there in Egg Harbor Township. And that night we will not be having church here May 23rd on Sunday evening. We'll be meeting over, the, over there at the tent meeting at 3 o'clock. The tent meeting starts. Okay. So 1 to 3, Sunday, May 23rd over there at Cardiff Baptist Church, dinner on the grounds, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, their services start at 7 o'clock at night. We will be having our Wednesday night Bible study kids club um, for those that will be here, but if you'd like to attend over there, you can um, you know, feel free to do so, and again, that's May 23rd through the 26th. Um, we're going to be having a piano dedication on our fifth Sunday of singing, and that's May 30th here at the church. We're holding our piano dedication. We're having a special guest pianist Graham Bergen, director of Shehi Summer School of Music with us, and there'll be a variety of sp special music and a lot of singing to praise and thank the Lord for his provision of a new piano, and we're looking forward to that. Again, that's May 30th here, Sunday evening, uh, fifth, fifth Sunday singing service, May 30th. And if you're here this morning and you have your offering, we have the offering box at the back of the church by the window, and if you're watching online, you can give through our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com. There's a giving link there that you can use, or if you'd like to text the phone number on our website, you can just text an amount, or if you'd like to mail your offering, we have the address to the church right on our website, and we're just going to take some time to pray for the offering and for the rest of the service. Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you, God, for everyone that's here, Lord, and God, we thank you, Lord, for a place to worship you in, Lord. We thank you, God, for um, how much you provide for us, Lord, and we know that all things come from you, Lord. All good things come from you. And we pray, God, that you would just continue to have your hand of blessing over our church. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to provide. Pray, God, for the building. And we thank you, God, that you um, have given us this building, Lord. And we look forward to the day that we can um, enjoy the, the next building, Lord. And we pray, Father, for, um, for the money to continue to come in for the piano, Lord. And we thank you, God, for the piano, Lord, and how good you've been to us. We pray, God, for the preaching of your word now. We pray for um, those that might be in here that do not know you as Lord and Savior, or if they're watching online, God, I pray that today they pass from death unto life, and that they would accept the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray, Lord, for the preaching of your word, that it would impact our lives, and we pray for the, the choir special now, Lord, and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the choir's going to come up.
I think you're outside today, not on the bus. That's a blessing. And they got donuts for you. And we'll be in 1 John chapter 3. Look at a few other passages of Scripture, but that'll be the main place that we'll be in. All right. Um... I'll tell you what, let's back up a little bit to John chapter 2, because the two main thoughts, we, we began this message last week, this will be the part two of it, um, but we began this message last week in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2, and the Bible says there, and now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, uh, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And so we're talking about this subject. The title's kind of awkward. It's a little bit weird. But if you're saved, you trust that Christ as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you. You have a new nature. Your body, your, the Bible says you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you've been quickened. That spirit that was dead has been quickened, given life to, because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. You have a new nature, and that new nature inside of you is trying to work its way out of you. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to be pushing you, driving you, leading you, guiding you um, to, to work out God's will in your life. Now, it'll never be a perfect process, and here's why. Because the old man that was there when the Holy Spirit moved in is still there. Um, even though you are a new creature in Christ, you have a new nature, the old man is still there. Paul talked about it. He called it his flesh. I know that in me, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So you still have that old nature that still desires to do what it wants to do. So we're not talking at all here about a sin, sinless perfection, that now that you're saved, you're just going to be perfect. You're never going to sin. However, that, that would be one extreme. The other extreme is, is that we... We almost deny the fact that the Holy Spirit of God is who created the universe is now inside of us trying to work his way out of us. And so uh, if the Holy Spirit is in you, and if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God is in you, the Holy Spirit of God is going to be influencing you, working in you, pushing you, uh, guiding you, directing you. And uh, you can either yield to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And really, that's what the whole idea of spirit fullness is all about. It's, it's allowing the Holy Spirit to have His will and His way in your life. It's, it's allowing the will of God to govern and control what you do. Um, so if you have the Holy Spirit in you, He's going to be pushing you in that direction. Now, let's just review these first 10 verses here of chapter 3, which we covered last week. And um, in this particular part of this chapter... It, it talks about the fact that if, if God is in you, if you're truly a child of God, then you're, you have the ability to live righteously, and God is going to be working in you 
to live righteously for that positional holiness that you have, positional holiness meaning God sees you as being sinless, that will work its way out of you to become a practical righteousness where it affects the way you live. Um, You know, we sing that song as children, you know, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. And why? There's been a great change since I've been born again. You are a new creature in Christ. The Holy Spirit of God is within you, and He's going to be moving you and directing you. I'll never forget when I first trusted Christ as my Savior. I mean, I I did not grow up in Christianity. I I was lost as a ball in high weeds. I didn't get saved until I was 25 years old. And I'm not going to, you know, go into all the things I used to do before I got saved. I just know that there was a cataclysmic change that took place in my life after I got saved. Um, you know, things were just different. I had different desires. Um, and I tried uh, for several months to continue to do some of those big, blatant, sinful things that we, we all did before we got saved. I had a real tough time doing it. I had no peace about it. And God began to purge some things. He's still purging some things. There's still a lot about this, the old man that's within me that still needs to change. But, uh, you know, the big major things that we all point to usually when somebody trusts Christ and whatever, it, he purged those things out uh, soon after I trusted Christ as my Savior. But let's consider this in, in chapter 3. We'll just read through verses 1 through 10 to kind of give a foundation for what we're going to talk about beginning in verse 11. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We'll be dealing with this again in the context of the second half of the chapter also. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Present tense. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, future. So God is doing something in and through us. We are the sons of God today because we're the children of God. The Bible says, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That word power, it's exousia, it's authority, if you will, to become the sons of God. And we are the sons of God, present tense, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear. So when we're in his presence, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, notice this, purifieth himself. So this is interesting. And in some of these verses, it seems like it's a foregone conclusion that you are going to be completely different now that you're saved. But then he also, in the middle of this, consistently challenges us to strive to be different. So in some sense, he's saying you are different, but he's saying, but you still need to try to be different as well. Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested or revealed or he came about to take away our sins. That's why he came. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And we shared last week, those are scary verses. People get nervous reading these verses. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand, because I don't want you, if you don't raise your hand, to lie. But if I was to ask the question, how many of you sinned uh, since you've been in this auditorium, since you got here? And the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. There's all kinds of things that are sin. It's not just adultery, murder, you know, it's not just those things, it's... Anything that's not done in faith is sin. Anybody who knows to do right and doesn't do it, that's sin. All sin. We're full of sin. Um, So, and then it says here, though, he that sins is of the devil. So what, what in the world? Those verses are scary. But we read also back in chapter 1, where he said, if we say we have no sin, in verse 8, we deceive ourselves. It almost sounds like there's a contradiction here. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, Back in John chapter 1, it says that. But here in John chapter 3, it says that, that he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, Um, whosoever, let me continue, whosoever is born of God 
doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now notice verse 10, it's transitional. It brings us to where we're going now in, in beginning in verse 11. He said, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So living right, doing right, not of God. Then he says, neither he that loveth not his brother. So the first part of the verse, of the chapter, those first 10, and really there's a lot of overlaps in both of these themes, but generally speaking, talks about the way we live as a result of who we are in Christ. You have God's nature, the nature of God inside of you, and he's working out of you. And um, if you'll yield to him, he'll work out of you and he'll use you and he'll change you and he'll use you to influence other people. And so this new nature, we talked about it last week and Paul, um, you know, deals with it extensively in Romans chapter seven, which we don't, we won't go there for now. But, you know, he talks about the battle inside of you. You get the new man versus the old man. Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, those things I do. He said, uh, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? Matter of fact, he said, for, um, he said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh. This is the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian, arguably, that ever lived. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. And we all have that old nature inside of us. And, um, but we also, if we're saved, if we trusted Christ genuinely, we have the new nature, the nature of God. The Bible refers to it as imputed righteousness. This is that new man, that new creature. Um, in Romans 3, verses 21 and 22, the Bible talks about this imputed righteousness, this, this positional holiness that we have. The Bible says there, but now the righteousness of God without the law, is manifested. Again, we see that word throughout John's writings, also here in, in Romans, Paul wrote this, and manifested, revealed, it's something we can easily see. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, in other words, the Old Testament pointed toward this and taught that this was going to happen. And then here it explains it in verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that's how we access this righteousness of God, not a really righteous man, but a, a righteous God, perfect, sinless, holy righteousness, which is, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So you and I, if we've been saved, we have that righteousness of God, and the righteousness of God, that positional holiness, that, that thing that God, as the judge, sees us now because we have Christ's righteousness. He took our sins. We got his righteousness. He sees us as perfectly holy. And he imparts in us a new nature. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed us. You have been sealed until the day of redemption. And the Holy Spirit of God has come in and he's transforming you into the image of his dear son. He's making us like Christ. And so when we got saved, we were justified. We're in this process now, and we were saved from the penalty of our sins when we got saved, but now we're being sanctified, and that's a process. Sometimes two steps forward, one step back. It's not a perfect process. We mess it up at times because sometimes we yield to our old nature, but we're in this process of sanctification. We're being delivered or saved from the power, the influence of sin in our life. Sin shall no more have dominion over you, and eventually, when we see Christ, when we're in His presence, the old nature will be gone, and there will be no more sin, we'll be delivered or saved from the very presence of sin. And so, but we're not there yet. But God, we're in the sanctification process where God is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And He's transforming us, and He's pushing us in that direction, and thus the battle is going on within us. And, um, and so... We, there ought to be that battle. And this is what, I'm, I am, I'm not trying at all to get anybody to doubt their salvation. And if you sinned before you got to church today, you're in good company because the rest of us did as well. What I'm trying to say is if you can sin easily and it doesn't bother you at all, there's no inner battle, no inner turmoil going on inside of you. There's no Holy Spirit of God that's convicting you and causing you to feel guilty beyond just conscious. Everybody's got a conscious out there. 
But beyond that, it's kind of like uh, somebody once described it as a conscience on steroids, the Holy Spirit of God in you. And, um, and so the Holy Spirit is bothering you, and He will not allow you to sin successfully. You know, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but there's not pleasure in sin for the long term. You, you'll have no peace. He'll tear you up on the inside. And if you're saved, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not saved, you may not understand it. But if you can just continue down a road that you know is in direct contradiction to the will of God, and it doesn't bother you at all, there's no battle, there's something wrong with that picture. And that's the whole idea of what he's talking about there. You have a new nature. That new nature is sinless, it's perfect, it's holy, it's righteous. Unfortunately, the, the other side of the schizophrenic you is there as well, the old man. And, uh, and he is resisting the will of God as well. But there is that battle going on. Now, in the remaining verses of chapter 3, John's going to give us something else about this new nature. The new nature within us will cause us not only to desire to live fulfilling God's will, to live in accordance to what Jesus wants for our lives, but it's also going to cause us to have a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul, back in the book of Romans in chapter 13, said that love is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, back there in, verse 13, in chapter 13 and verse 8 of the book of Romans, they'll put it up on the screen for you. I'll just quote it for you here. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So all those commandments there that were read, they're all commandments that have to do with our relationships with each other. And Paul says very basically that you, you fulfill the law first by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but also by loving your neighbor as yourself, not disobeying God's commandments regarding our relationships with each other, and we love our neighbors that way. And so love is very important. Listen, love's not easy sometimes. There are people that rub you the wrong way, and there are people that may have done you really, really dirty in life, and they may even be brothers and sisters in Christ, though you may at times doubt their salvation. Maybe they're doubting your salvation, whatever. And again, I'm not a big guy that doubts salvation. I know that uh, if you follow me around and watch me very carefully, there's times you're going to see things coming out of me that are not very consistent with salvation, okay? Because I have a flesh too. And if I follow you around, uh, J. Vernon McGee once said this. He said, if you knew me like I knew me, you wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. He said, you wouldn't listen to me on the radio. He said, but if I knew you the way you know you, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with you either. And so I'm not trying to get anybody to look into anybody else's life, certainly doubt their own salvation or whatever. I'm just trying to say this is difficult for us sometimes because our flesh is perfectly capable of hating somebody and acting in hatred more than just feeling hatred towards somebody. And But God, that new creature, that new nature within us is desiring and causing and pushing and driving us toward forgiveness, toward love, toward acting in love, as well as even feeling love toward people that were not naturally, um, you know, that are not naturally easy to love. And so that's where we are here in this passage of Scripture. Look at verse 11. I haven't prayed yet. I need to pray. Let me pray. And then it moves quicker from here, I promise you. And I'll ask God to help me to move quicker. Brother Snap, you'd appreciate that, wouldn't you, if I moved quicker? He wants to get home. Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for your word. We pray. Lord, that you would help me as I'm, I'm trying to clearly articulate these thoughts and my mind gets all jumbled up and I have a lot of stuff written down, but really I'd like to be able to just flow through this. And God, I know you can help me to do that. And I've studied, I've prepared, but uh, Lord, to clear, and this is not easy plowing. Sometimes you go through these verses and I'm not saying they're necessarily confusing, but we almost misunderstand what, what you're saying. And I pray you'd help us to understand it. And Lord, I pray you'd work uh, through this service. I pray, God, if there's anybody either here or 
are watching online, and we have several people watching with us online, I pray if they're not saved that today would be the day of their salvation. Uh, but God, I pray you'd help us in this matter of loving each other. Um, you're, we're commanded to do that. And it's not just something we can naturally do by commandment. It's something that's supernatural because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God within us that will enable us to be able to do this. Now, I know we can resist, but God, I pray you'd help us not to. And I pray we would yield to what you're trying to do in our, in our lives. And God, we pray you'd bless now. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So look at verse 11, beginning here down through verse 15, we see what I call here the contradiction of love, meaning... God's going to give us several examples of things that contradict the concept of love. In verse 10, he introduces this passage of Scripture. That's the transitional thing. But in verse 11, he, he, he shares um, about, or in verse 12 rather, he talks about Cain. But let me, let me start in verse 11. It says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. So again, this is what this section we're coming into is all about it's about loving each other uh, Jesus taught it um, by the way Jesus went well beyond um, what was commanded in the law or went or what was expected like the Jewish people uh, Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 43 he said you've heard that it hath been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy I don't think God ever commanded them to hate their enemy um, but people just had that natural idea that hey it's okay to love your neighbor but and love the people that love you and love the people that uh, are within the household of faith but but we're to love where we can it's okay to hate our enemies but Jesus said no don't do that he said I say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, God blesses everybody. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. The publicans were the tax collectors. They were despised by everybody. They were kind of synonymous with wretched sinners. He said, do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. And then he says this, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now the word perfect is not sinless, it just means you're mature, you're complete. And let me say this, this is Christian maturity. It's not easy to love people that are unlovable. It's not easy, but uh, somebody who's spiritually mature will be able to do it. Uh, it's not easy to live a, a sinless and holy life when our when our, and never perfectly, sinlessly, but what, what I'm saying is it's not easy to do that when our flesh is desiring us to go in another direction. But Christian maturity, maturity is, is getting to that place where we're fully equipped, complete, to do the things that God wants us to do, but we're mature enough to desire to do those things. And, um, and, and by the way, Jesus also taught in John's gospel, you know, that we're to love one another, in John chapter 13, 34 and 35, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, that's a new commandment. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. In John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This thing I command you, in verse 17, he said, that you love one another. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love. Uh, all that, all the verses there the whole chapter is about love. The, word, the Bible word is charity. It's that agape love. It's that deep, unconditional, abiding love. The love in action. And then the Bible also talks about phileo love. It's affection. It's fraternal love. It's, it's, uh, it's kindness. Things like that. And by the way, charity, agape, is kind, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13. And so these are all things that the Bible speaks about regarding love. And we're to have those things for each other. Now, he gives the example of Cain in verse 12. Notice what it says there. It says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. And we won't turn there for time's sake, but Genesis 4 deals with the whole story of Cain and Abel. And it's a very familiar story. Most of us learned it when we were kids. Even as a lost person, I knew the story of Cain and Abel. And uh, Abel and Cain both brought offerings. Abel, uh, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground. 
And of course, you know, the theologians would all say that, that his offering represented the works of men's hands. He was trying to work his way into favor with God, whereas Abel brought a blood sacrifice. He, he brought a, 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 flock, a part of the flock, uh, you know, an animal to sacrifice, which represented a blood sacrifice. And the Bible said that God had respect unto Abel's offering. Now, Cain, he got upset about that. He got jealous. He was envious because God had respect. God said that I approve of Abel's offering. I don't approve of your offering. And instead of just fixing it and getting it right, the Bible says if you, if you, if you get it right, you're fine. But if you don't, sin lies at the door. And that envy, God actually said to him, he said, why are you wroth? Why are you so upset about this? If you do well, well you'll be accepted. And, uh, but he got envious. He got jealous. And sin was literally lying at the door. And that feeling of anger and hatred and animosity he had toward his, toward his brother, it overflowed up out of his heart and it came, became action and he killed his brother. And, um, and, you know, the Bible talks about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In other words, you know, the, the, it begins with a feeling. That's why Jesus said, by the way, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already because it begins in the heart. It starts here. And hatred and animosity and unforgiveness and all these things, they, they're in the heart. But they, then they work themselves out into action. And so Jesus is going to deal with this. And uh, in this passage of scripture, so Cain, he hated his brother. He was envious. And then notice in verse 13, it says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. So not only we're not supposed to be like Cain, we're not supposed to be like the world and the world doesn't have God. So the world is not going to have love. The Bible says God is love. God is agape. And if God is agape, the world doesn't have God. So the world doesn't have agape. And the world naturally cannot love you. And, um, and by the way, you're not supposed to love the world either. We already learned that in 1 John chapter 2. And we're not talking about people in the world. We're to love people. We're even to love our enemies. But we're not to love the things that people do out there in the world. In, first, in John chapter 15, Jesus already spoke about the world hating us. He said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So if the world hates you, just expect it. The world hated Jesus. Why, why should you be any different? And so the world is, don't, don't be surprised if the world hates you. And then notice verses 14 and 15, uh, back in our text here in 1 John chapter 3, it says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And by the way, don't get torn up by that. He's not saying that a murderer cannot be forgiven or any other type of sinner cannot be forgiven. Paul was a murderer. Paul had Stephen put to death. He was consenting unto his death. Moses was a murderer. Uh, remember, the, he killed the Egyptian uh, that, that slew one of the Hebrews, and, he, and uh, he was a murderer. David was a murderer. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he had one of his own mighty men. Uriah the Hittite was one of David's faithful mighty men. And he had Uriah the Hittite put in the forefront of the hottest battle, and he had him put to death. He, 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 he called for his execution by doing so. He was a murderer. Uh, Peter, by the way, attempted murder in the Garden of Gethsemane after three years of spending time with Jesus. He cut off Malchus's ear, remember? You think he was aiming for his ear? I think he was aiming for his head. And he missed and he got him in the ear. And Jesus healed his ear, but he was trying to kill him. And so he was a murderer. So God's not saying that a person who's committed murder or any other sin cannot be saved. Um, but he is saying that hatred and murder are inconsistent with that new nature. And by the way, that's what Galatians says back in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, he contrasts the works of the old nature as opposed to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He calls them the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5 and verse 19, the Bible says this, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. There's that word again. They're clearly seen, revealed. Which are these? Adultery. 
fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That old nature that does those things, it's not saved, it's not going to heaven. And in a general way, people who have a new nature don't do these things, at least not nearly as much. I'm not saying it's not possible for saved people to do these things, get drunk and all this other stuff, that their old man is still there and it's possible, but they can't continue down that road. And remember I told you there were two main ideas with this. One idea with this whole somewhat scary passage in 1 John is that the, the, one of the interpretations is, is if you're genuinely saved, there's no way you can continue down the road of sin. The other idea is, is one is talking about the new nature, one is talking about the old nature. I believe both are kind of relevant. Because you have a new nature inside of you, you cannot continue down that road of sin. And I believe if you try to, if you just completely resist what God is doing, God is going to pull you up out of here. He's going to take you home to heaven. You're here to glorify God. You're, you're here. The whole reason, why didn't God just take us to heaven the moment we got saved? Everything you do in life for God, you could do better in His presence. You can worship God better if He was right in front of you. You could praise God better there. You could study the Bible better because you could just say, Jesus, what does this mean? I don't get this. Everything we do, we could do better if we were in heaven with him. But there's one thing we can't, we can't glorify God in front of lost people trying to reach people with the gospel up in heaven. It's all over once we get to heaven. Our ability to influence this world, to shine the light of Christ to the world around us, it stops when we're in heaven. But that's why we're here. And if we're not going to glorify him, then he'll have to just take us up out of here. And I believe he'll do anything. He corrects us. You know, the Bible, Hebrews chapter 5, whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He corrects us. He does what he's got to do to get us turned around. So we have all these works of the flesh which are manifest, but then he talks about, in verse 22 of Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit... In other words, if we have the Spirit of God, if we have this new nature, let's walk in the Spirit. Let's yield to what the Spirit is trying to do in our lives. Look at verse 16 down through verse 18. Notice we see the application of love there. He says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. So Christ demonstrated love perfectly. What does the Bible say? He commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he said, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And love is willing to sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice, of course, is being willing to die for somebody. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. But we're willing to sacrifice. You may not be called upon um, to lay down your life for somebody, to actually die for somebody. But, but you can sacrifice for your brothers and sisters in Christ and for other people in, in many different ways. And so, um, and it goes on to say, look at verses 17 and 18. It says, but whoso hath this world's good. So here's a, an example, an illustration of what we can do. You see somebody that has a need. And seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. In other words, you just ignore the compassion that's on the inside of you, and you don't do anything to help him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not just say, talk the talk, let's, let's not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So again, many of us, I mean, we can talk a good game. You know, we'll, and especially when we're talking about ourselves, we'll talk about how loving we are. But uh, we, the love that we're to have for people, it's got to work its way outside into action. Love does what is necessary to meet the needs of others. And so love is applied. It's not just something we talk about. And then notice the verification of love in verse 19. It says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. 
For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. So here again, John is referring to the presence of these characteristics as evidence that God is really in us, working through us via His Holy Spirit. And notice in verse 22, it's almost parenthetical, God indicates that because we're truly His children who are trying to please Him by living for Him and loving other people for Him, He now delights in answering our prayer. Notice what it says there, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. It almost looks like you know, God was just looking for a place to shove a, a verse about answered prayer and He just kind of you know, went eeny, meeny, miny, mo and just stuck it right in here, but it's, it's in the context. See, if, if you're allowing God to work in and through you, you're seeking to please Him, you're, you're doing those things that are pleasing in His sight, and you're trying to love people for the Lord, God will answer your prayers. Your prayers are completely unselfish. Um, they're, they're asked from the, uh, unselfishly from that new man, that new nature. They're not asked to satisfy some sinful fleshly desire. We're not asking for a new Maserati so that we can look cool among the neighbors or a new house, you know, uh, that, that uh, we can just whatever. And I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for a house or any of those things. You, you follow what I'm saying? We're not just trying to live large and satisfy all the desires that we have. We're asking for things that please God. We're asking for things that are about helping other people. They're asked for the purpose of fulfilling God's will and meeting the needs of others. And by the way, I've always believed this. I believe your prayer time ought to be broken up. Obviously, you're going to spend some time confessing sin. You're going, to, you're going to spend some time praising and worshiping God, thanking God for who He is, worshiping God for who He is, thanking God for what He's done. But when you do get around to confessing, it ought to be, or not confessing, petitioning, asking for things, it ought to be you pray for the kingdom of God, those, those requests that involve God's kingdom, people getting saved, those things. Then the needs of others, sometimes they're synonymous. And then eventually you get around for those selfish requests those things that you pray for yourself. But I believe this, if the Bible says if you delight yourself in Him, He'll give you the desires of your heart. So you really don't have to worry about what you need. God knows what you need. You worry about praying for other people. And, and God will be, and I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for your own needs, not at all. I think, that, I think, but most of us, that's all we pray for. We know we have a need, and we pray for, then we start praying. And, uh, but it ought to be we're just consumed with God and the will of God and other people's needs, that's what Christ was consumed with when he was here on this earth. And so many of us were just very, very, you know, selfish, and myself included. I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching at me. So look at verse 23 and 24, and we wrap this thing up, and he kind of concludes the entire chapter, the theme, both themes, in these verses. He said, and this is the commandment, his commandment, that we should believe on the name of, the, of His Son, Jesus Christ, love one another as He gave His commandment, and he that keepeth His commandments dwelleth in Him, and He in Him. So that was the first part of the chapter, keeping His commandments, living righteously, doing right, and hereby we know that He abideth in us by the Spirit which He hath given us. And again, the greatest indicator of genuine faith is the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. It's, it's, it's the greatest assurance of salvation. I mean, there's a lot of things we can understand the Scriptures, but then that's because we have the Spirit of God also. The Bible says the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And again, I knew that there was some... When I trusted Christ as my Savior, when I was 25 years old, 31 years ago, there was a change. And it wasn't because I had some preacher yelling at me. And, and again, I, I had a unique... I didn't get, grow up in church. I was... I was a truck driver, salesman, driving for my dad's company, listening to Christian radio, and God just gradually, and it, and it was a months listening to Christian radio before I actually got saved. But when I got saved, man, there were changes that came about. I tried to continue down the same path that I was on after I got saved, and I couldn't do it, just couldn't do it. Jesus said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And it's, it's not easy. If God, God was in me. And he was pushing me in the other direction. I was resisting what he was trying to do, and it was a losing battle. I mean, the God that created the universe is inside a little old me pushing me. It's not much of a fight. And so, anyway, let me give you a, just a couple of practical thoughts. 
Love sacrifices, we already talked about that. You've heard this expression, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You love something or somebody, you're going to give towards it. And by the way, um, the Bible says where your heart is, there will your treasure be. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. What does it say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you, let me, let me challenge you with something. If you have somebody you don't like, give to them. I'm not talking about giving them money, but maybe give them some acknowledgement, give them a word of praise, a word of encouragement, maybe do something nice for them. You don't even have to do it to where they know that you're doing it. You can do it anonymously. Give them something, you know, just whatever. Just do something. You invest in somebody's life. We love our children. Why? Is it just natural or is it because we've been investing our lives our treasure, our talent, our time in our children, grandchildren. And your heart follows that. So where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if you're investing in something that God wants you to love, I think your heart, the feeling part, the phileo kind of love will follow that. So um, if, if you love, you're going to be willing to sacrifice for somebody. And Jesus, God so loved, the Bible says, that he gave his only begotten son. And we really don't have too much of a problem giving and sacrificing for the people we love. But what we need to work on is broadening that group of people that we love enough that we're willing to sacrifice for. And God says we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ this way. So love sacrifices, but then love also stands. So we're not just talking about all this ooey gooey, you know, love, 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 love. If you really love people, you're going to stand for what's right also. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's, there's two different groups in, in Christianity. There's the group that says, well, you just got to love everybody and just that's all that matters. And then there's the group over here that says, well, bless God, we've got to live right. We got we to gotta do right. We got to stand for the truth and all that. And they, they, they try to act perfectly. They dot their I's and cross their T's. But yet they're not so concerned about caring for people. Uh, when I was in Bible college out of Longview, man, that church did right. They acted right. They dressed right. They were, they were like militant about all that stuff. And they, they went soul winning, which, I mean, that's an act of love to try to win somebody to Christ. They were soul winners. But they didn't love people in like, in other ways. And I worked across the street with a bunch of people that didn't, quote, do everything right like that church across the street did. I worked over there at the supermarket, but there were some safe people there that loved me and they loved my family. And they demonstrated that love to me in tangible ways. And, 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 I, and I'm going to say this, both are important. It's important to stand for the truth, but it's also important to love people and have compassion on people and forgive people and all those things. So um, the Bible says speaking the truth in love. Sometimes you're going to have to speak the truth to people, and the truth hurts sometimes. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, it says in the book of Proverbs. And if you're faithful and you're a friend and you're loving somebody, you're going to have to wound them sometimes by telling them something that they don't want to hear. So it's not just all this feel-good stuff. Sometimes loving people involves doing what's right. A parent that loves his child will discipline his child. And that's not, you know, we don't think about that as, as loving, but it is love. It's genuine love. And the best thing that you can do for your brothers and sisters in Christ here at the church is to just keep standing for the Lord. Don't allow yourself to be lured out of the will of God by the devil. Don't change doctrinally. Don't waver. Stay true. And, and they'll have somebody they can look at that's a, a rock of Gibraltar. He's stable. And when they're wavering, they'll have somebody they can look to, an anchor that they can cling to. The Bible says, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And Jesus, uh, uh, in Ephesians, Paul said that we shouldn't be like children tossed to and fro. So man, stand true to what you believe and be willing to help those that are struggling. But you be the rock um, and, and that, that stays consistent. And then finally this, love submits, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Um, we need to be willing to surrender our will at times to the will of other people. You know, you don't have to get your way all the time. Now, I, I said this in earlier service. I'm not changing my Bible to make you happy or to please you. I, I know what I believe about this, and this is what I believe, and I'm standing on it. And if you don't like it, I, I, I'm not trying to be mean, but I really don't care. However, I'll change the color of the carpet to make you happy. 
I'll change whatever, some, the way we do something or some non-biblical doctrinal issue, non-doctrinal issue. I really don't care about those things. And so I should be willing to submit. It's not my way or the highway. You know, I get what I want. Dennis Corll said this, and it, was, it literally transformed my life when he said this. He said, do you know why my wife submits to me? You know, the Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. But the verse right before it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. He said, do you know why my wife submits to me? He said, because 99% of the time I submit to her. I give her whatever she wants, and any time I can, I let her have her way. But every once in a while, I really feel like there's something that God would not want, want us to do as a family, and I say, you know what? I, I'm, I, I'm going to hold to my guns in this area, and she'll willingly submit to him in that area. Why? Because she knows that all other times, he's bending over backwards to give her whatever she wants. So we should be, if you love people, you ought to be willing to submit to them. Maybe submit's not a good word. Acquiesce to their wishes. Allow them to have their desire, their way. Do what they want to do instead of you getting your way, doing what you want to do all the time. Love should be willing to do this. And um, illustrations, boy of love. When the pandemic started, you know, Joe, he's out, I don't think he's out in the parking lot now. But when we had... um, the, the, when I got COVID, okay, uh, back in September, Joe was at my house every day. He's a nurse, and, uh, but he would come over. He's scared to death of this virus. I don't think he's scared of the virus. He's scared of giving the virus to somebody else. So he's extremely careful because he, he was working in the COVID wing at the hospital or at the Bacharach. And, uh, but he would come over to my house every day. He'd put this hazmat suit on practically with two masks and gloves but he would come over every day, and I had it, my wife had it, and Hannah had it, and he'd come over and he'd check our pulse, and he'd check our oxygen, and he checked our blood pressure, and he made sure we had everything we need. He brought stuff over, he brought food over for us. Are you guys okay? He was monitoring to, you know, to make sure that the oxygen level didn't get down, because once it gets down to a certain point, you really need to do something. You need to get something other than just take care of it yourself. And he, he knew just where that point was, and so he was watching. And, you know, I mean, why would he do that? Because he loved me. He cares. And it wasn't just me either. Stephanie got it, and other people got it at the church. If they would let him, some people weren't letting him. But he was, tra- every morning, he worked third shift. Every morning, he would come around to people's houses. You okay? Let me check you, and, and all that. Bob Fenton, and he's here. He's out there in the parking lot somewhere. These guys won't come in. They stay outside. Uh, they're out there doing their security gig out there in the parking lot. But Bob used to go to ShopRite. You remember back in the day, ShopRite was, it was open from 7 to 8 for older people? I made the cut, by the way. I was 55, uh, 56. So, so I made the cut. I was allowed in. But Bob would go to ShopRite. He'd go to, he'd go to the Walmart in Hamilton. He'd go to all these different stores early in the morning to get what they had. Because, you know, everybody was out of toilet paper and out of paper towels and cleaning supplies. He traveled around. He'd pick up whatever he could pick up. And then he traveled around the church giving the stuff out. He'd come to my house every morning. I got toilet paper this morning. Preacher, you, you need toilet paper? I got cleaning supplies. We got Lysol wipes and stuff. But he, wanted to, he went around the church. Why would he do that? It's because he loves people. He loves his brothers and sisters in Christ. And going back to our wedding... Friday, you traveled down from Connecticut. From Connecticut to Bowie, Maryland, how long was that? Five hours. We, it was three hours plus for us, almost four hours for us. And a bunch of us, I mean, there had to be 40 or 50 people from our church that went down to this wedding in Bowie, Maryland. And it was a lot. It was a lot of setting up. It was crazy. Wind was blowing on Friday, trying to figure out. I was telling Ms. Camille, we're trying to figure out where the sun is so our tablet doesn't start frying uh, when, when you know, it's out in the sun. And, uh, you know, trying to figure it all out, they had to set the sound system up, and then these guys all stayed. Uh, Brother Jim and I, we left. Uh, but, uh, but there was a good group of people from the church here that stayed till after it was all over, and then they had to get all our stuff back, the sound equipment and all that stuff, then bring it back to the church, and then get it all set up here, and, and all, it's a lot of work. But why did they do that? Because they love Wade. And they love a Stephanie, and they don't even know a Stephanie. She's new. You know, so we don't know her enough to love her because of what she does for us. But we were trying to demonstrate Christ-like love to people. 
And that's what we do. That's what Christians do. And, and by the way, let me say this. I praise the Lord. This is a very loving church. A very non-judgmental church. Man, we got some people at this church that are really blown it. Let me tell you. I mean, I mean, we made the big, big mistakes. But this church has rallied around us in love. And that's awesome. And, and by the way, we, we appreciate that. And, and you're going to get the same treatment. Hopefully, the church will stay the same when you blow it. And you're going to blow it, too. <laughs> it's going to happen. Let me say this. Some of you who have young children, don't criticize people with teenagers. Because your kids ain't teenagers yet. <laughs> ah, that guy, he ought to do something with that kid. Yeah, when yours is two, he's easy to control. Wait till he grows up. But uh, anyway, love. We need love. Love each other. And, and again, we don't have to compromise what we believe to love people. We just don't. Um, but we have, to, um, we, we have to love people. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God, for your word. We pray you'd help us in this, in this area. And God, sometimes people are easy to love, sometimes not so easy. And when we're in our flesh, it's not easy to love anybody. We only really love ourselves when we're in the flesh. But God, I pray that we would yield to the Spirit of God within us that is trying to get us to reach into the lives of other people and be a blessing and a help to them. Give them the things that they need and uh, encourage them when they need encouragement. Weep with them when they're, when they're grieving. And God, I pray you'd help us to see all these things. And there's a myriad of ways we can apply this in our lives. God, you need to help us to figure out how exactly we're supposed to put this into practice. But loving people is not just what we feel. It's going to be what we practice ultimately. And so, God, I pray that you would help us with that and help us to be a loving church, a loving people. Help us to love those people in our extended family, people in our neighborhoods and all those other places as well, beyond just our brothers and sisters here at the church. God, I pray that you'd help us to do that. God, I pray if there's somebody here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. I pray and bless our invitation, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So I'll stand to our feet just for a moment. We'll just have a moment of invitation if God spoke to your heart. And, and let me say this, if, if God spoke to your heart, respond. If God put somebody in your mind's eye that you need to love, respond. I'm not saying you got to come to the altar to respond, but right now with your head bowed, your eyes closed, tell the Lord I heard you and I'm going to do something about it. By the way, if, if you're still resisting what God's trying to do inside your heart regarding loving somebody, maybe there's somebody out there you really have a problem with. Ask the Lord to help you with that. Maybe you're not willing to do what you need to do yet. And I'm not saying you're not saved, but there's a battle going on inside of you. I'm saying ask God's help. You need help to forgive people sometimes that have hurt you. But you need to love those people. If you're here today, you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or maybe you're watching online and you never trusted Christ as your Savior. Boy, you need, you need to get that matter settled. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And you were not worthy. Uh, you were spitting in God's face when he died for you. And God loved you enough to come to this sin-cursed earth and die for you. If it was me, I would have just started over again. I think I would have created a bunch of robots that would have just worshipped me all the time. But God didn't do that. He, he came to this earth to die on the cross for people who were unlovely, unloving. And he wants you to be saved. He's reaching out to you. He offers you the gift of salvation. You're worthy of judgment. But God says that if you're willing to believe on him, trust the fact that he died on the cross for your sins, he'll save you. He'll take you to heaven when you die. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're a sinner. You deserve judgment, but Christ will save you. If you're here today and you're not sure about your salvation, boy, I'd love to talk to you after the service. I'll be standing right over there by the door. And if you need somebody to talk to about your salvation, if you have any doubts about where you're going when you die, we'd love to share from the Bible how you can know for sure. If you're watching online, there's a button on our website that says, Why Jesus? Click on that button. There's a lot of information. By the way, if you, if you respond to us, Hit that My Response button. We'll answer any questions you might have.
Amen. We're going to close out the service with our theme song, We'll Run the Race. We'll run the race, we will press on, keep up the pace, don't Bye.